Good morning. You know, last week in my uh, sermon, I had a, um, I wrote a few comments about struggles that we face in, uh, in life and its effect that it has on us. I said that we, we live with constant reminders that the world, that in this world there is trouble and sorrow. That at its core, every single one of us knows that something just is not right. That there is this, um, this sense that all is just not right with the world. And what happens is that life brings with it a relentless barrage of such news that sometimes it makes life difficult. It brings with it a, a deep sadness that is not easily consoled. And what happens is eventually these kinds of experiences have a way of leaving their marks on a person's heart. And when that begins to happen, those marks begin to form calluses. And those calluses grow like what a callus is supposed to do, right? A callus grows in order to protect. And so we, we get this news and the next thing you know, we start to build these calluses around our life to protect our heart, to minimize our disappointments, to keep us from despair. But the thing is, as those calluses begin to thicken, something else happens. We begin to discover that perhaps our dreams are beginning to fade. You start expecting less. We get a little bit more cynical. And the problem then is that we just start to settle because we convince ourselves that something is better than nothing. And then we just live our life and inside there is a sense that we just curse the pain that life brings or we mourn the brokenness of past relationships and we grieve and lament that there is no easy comfort. In a book called Please Don't Squeeze the Christian, a guy by the name of Scott Cernow reflects on the danger of cynicism, especially in the life of believers who claim to have this living hope. Listen to this word. He says, cynicism kills in the manner of frostbite. The only symptom is a deadening numbness. And even Christians are often tinged with this frostbite. Callousness and doubt numb us to life and joy. We, we find ourselves leaving the triumphant lyrics of the old hymns on the church doorstep because they appear hopelessly out of step with the world that's waiting outside. Our problem is not that we've been taught to question our faith, but rather that we've been taught to reject any answers. Why don't you think about that for a moment? Doubt can be a state of mind or it can be a way of life. If you've been taught to reject any answers, it's like, I'm done learning. I, I don't really expect much anymore. And I guess I'm just gonna have to make this up as I'm going. It's important though that I think as believers that we take what the scriptures say and begin to you know, uh, shape that into, into one's life. If you think of your life here and let's say now I've come to a place where I, I, I do believe that Jesus is this son of God. What do you think the end goal is? Like, what comes after that? What comes after a profession of faith? What comes after I begin to take seriously these claims of Jesus? Because this is my life right here. And then if I'm looking at heaven over here, this, this life to come, there's a whole lot in between. And what are we going to do about navigating that? You see, God has done something for us, though. God has provided this bridge. He's provided this bridge from this life into the one to come, and it's through his son, Jesus. It has everything to do with his life and his ministry, his death and resurrection. The, that becomes for us the bedrock for our faith. 
Today, we're going to engage in a whole new series called What's Next? And I want you to grasp something more from this resurrection of Jesus. I want you to consider what's next, what comes after you believe. I want us to begin today by looking at a text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and identify some very practical kind of implications for daily living. And my hope is that you'll see the resurrection is something that is very useful, that the truth is concrete, and that it will bring meaning and purpose into your life. So why don't you, um, if you're here for the first time, I want you to know that in, in your bulletins there are uh, sermon notes that have the text of Scripture there, as well as some uh, questions that you could perhaps uh, engage in a discussion with some friends in a small group. We call it connect groups here, and it's a way of just thinking through what we're learning today and uh, wrestling with that with some friends. So the first thing I want you to recognize here is that in the text that we're going to look at, the death of Jesus is going to provide some new meaning to our life. But for that to happen, for this new meaning to come, we have to have eyes to see. The reality of death can cause us to view life as though it were without meaning. You know, um, so many people, you talk to them, and it's like they're just trying to find some secure handle just to make sense of what's going on all around us. But here's the reality. We work hard, but you can't take it with you. You could spend a whole lifetime learning and achieving, and you're going to wind up in the same place that the fool winds up in the grave. It it appears that life plays this very cruel kind of a joke. And the Apostle Paul adds some insight into where this life is heading. And it involves some bad news and some good news. Let's take the bad news first. Look at the text here in verse 50 uh, from chapter 15. It says, I declare to you, brothers, that Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. See, the bad news is that the kingdom of God is denied to us in our present state. It says here that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, that the perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. See, both propositions here make the same same point. Lamely, that, it's, that in its present state, this flesh and blood cannot inherit God's kingdom. And why is that? Because this body is subject to decay. This body is in need of a transformation. This body that has been inherited from Adam has been compromised because of the fall of man. Sin has brought weakness to our flesh, dishonor to the image of God we bear, a curse that causes our our bodies to perish. And this is the reality to which everyone is subjected. I know that's, it's, it's awful, but it's the truth. And no amount of, you know, uh, rose-colored glasses is going to change that. The reality, though, of the kingdom of God reinforces the words of the Apostle Paul, where he draws this kind of dichotomy. He says, look, there is a natural body, and he tells us there is a spiritual body. An entrance into the realm of the kingdom of God is going to require that we have a transformation. In 1 Corinthians 15, just a few verses ahead, he says this. He says, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have been, bo- just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall be- bear the likeness of the man from heaven. There is this promise then that this kingdom of God is going to be inherited by those who go through a transformation. The bad news is that in our current state, the kingdom of heaven is off limits. The good news, though, is that change is coming. That's the, that's the good news. Listen in verse 51. It says, listen, I tell you a mystery. 
We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. You see that transformation that has to take place? If we are going to inherit the kingdom of God, it says the dead will need to be raised. This perishable body must become imperishable. Mortal must be swallowed up by immortality. The natural becomes the spiritual. And so if the good news is that change is coming, that day of restoration is certain. There is coming a day when all things will be restored to its original design. And once again, we will see God as he is. We will not look through a glass dimly anymore. Listen to these words that are found in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. He says this, he says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away, and he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Those are throne words. Those are words that are found in the mouth of God. That is a description of what lies ahead. And all of this is going to come as a result of God's appointed time. Now, I wish that was different. I wish, don't you wish it would just happen like today? Like everything swallowed up. No more of this pain and crying. No more of this death or mourning. But somehow or another, everything is made new as God had originally intended. But it will come at his appointed time. We're called to make ourselves ready, to be prepared, to, to watch with vigilance. Because the good news is not only that change is coming, the good news is that death has lost all of its power. See, the enemy of our souls is vanquished. Death, so intimidating, unrelenting, unstoppable, is now the one who's being taunted. The text tells us, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? You see, up until this moment, death's power to inflict harm was rendered certain due to the penalty imposed by sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And when death delivered its sting, <laughs> it was with lethal consequence. When death embedded its barb deep into our mortal flesh, its victims fell dead. Until this moment. Until this moment, death's power was unrelenting. It proved itself victorious over every generation of mankind. Death's victory seemed a foregone conclusion. Our attempts to stave, it, stave off its coming, they prove to be a lesson in futility. Seriously, it doesn't matter how many yoga classes you take. Some of you, those Pilates classes, they're not going to work either. And for those of you who are mixing in a little shake some dried kale and seafood, uh, seaweed and everything else, that ain't gonna work either. <laughs> Man, here, here's the deal, like death comes unrelenting. But the truth is that death now, that it could, that it could be the backdrop of everything that seems to be meaningless. When you look at death now through the lens of Jesus and his death, we recognize that it's lost all its power. That's why in verse 57 it says, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the good news is that victory comes through Jesus. It's not just that the, Jesus' death says, hey, change is coming because I was changed. I, I experienced this transformation. I experienced this resurrection. So the change for me means change for you. 
My victory over the grave means that it has lost its power. And so that power now is given to you. And in the same fashion now, it says the good news is that the victory is going to come to us through Jesus. See, the problem of sin was answered at the cross. This suffering servant, Jesus, took upon himself the judgment our sins deserved. Death reached out to claim him, but was denied. Death's power proved no match against the sinless offering of the Son of God. It was impossible for death to hold him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave could not hold him. Death lost. Death's chains were broken. Death's shroud was cast aside. Death died in the death of Jesus. You catch that? That's why it says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. This, this reconciliation that took place as a result of this death offering of Jesus, paying for our sin, is now the lens that he's asking us to look at life through. Without that, what is our hope? It's going to be like generation after generation of people who come and they live for a little while and then they're gone. It's like the... It's like the Proverbs that it says, we appear like grass for a little while and then it fades. But in Christ, it says, if we die in him, we will be made alive. So our death has meaning. It is not without meaning. But it has to be framed in the person of Jesus. As it was in this death, Consider this resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus gives our lives purpose. The reason why it gives us purpose is this. The kingdom of God is now open to those who, who, who died and are raised in Christ. Death finds meaning in the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf. For if we died with Christ, that means that our sins have been forgiven. Judgment has been passed over. Life finds purpose in the resurrection of Jesus. And what kind of purpose is that? Well, it's not about just what is going to come, but it's about the present. Look at verse 58. It says, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. I want you to think about this for a moment. We've just been talking about the perishable putting on the imperishable. That which is mortal putting on that which is immortal. The natural being swallowed up by this spiritual body. Everything has been looking at this present life in relationship to this glory that still awaits those who have died in Christ. Now, all of a sudden, because of the resurrection of Jesus, he says to them, my brothers, I want you to what? Stand firm and let nothing move you. The focus now shifts from heaven back to earth. Do you catch that? Everything now is not just about the you know, the life to come, it has everything to do with now. It is in this life that you are being exhorted to be unshakable, immovable. The focus shifts from heaven to earth because Paul has been making his case. He turns the attention to the believers and summons them to think about this life. And you know why? You want to think about this life now based on the resurrection of Jesus because the resurrection is going to provide a stable foundation on which to build your life. Why? Because the power that raised Jesus is now the power that will raise you. The sacrifice of Jesus was accepted. The penalty of our sin was cast upon him. The life that he now has promised is ours. So the resurrection, it provides this stable foundation, but the resurrection also brings assurance of God's power. And I want you to think of that text in relationship to this next truth. 
that the resurrection reveals God's heart. The resurrection reveals God's heart towards those who trust in Jesus. So you have this assurance of power, and you have this revealing of God's heart. How does that work? There is a text that's found in the first chapter of of 2 Corinthians, where Paul uncharacteristically shows a side of him. He says that he didn't want the community of believers to be unaware of the struggles that he was facing. And then he says this, he says, it were as if I had the sentence of death within myself. So much so that I despaired even of life. You have to be in a pretty dark place like that, don't you? Where you despair even of life. You just want this done. I don't like this spot that I'm in. I'm despairing of life. I have like death sentence in my soul. There's nothing that seems to be bringing me hope. And then you know what he says? He says, this has happened so that I might not rely on my strength, but on God who raises the dead. You catch that? His hope came as a result of the assurance of power that was demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, he turns around and says, that is a great comfort to me because I'm feeling dead on the inside. I need a God who is going to be able to take me and raise me up. And so the resurrection then becomes not only a stable foundation to build your life, but it becomes the assurance of God's power as well as proof positive that God's heart towards you is tender. So that's why for me, life begins to really demonstrate purpose because of this resurrection of Jesus. And then catch this last thing here. In verse 58, he says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Listen to that again. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Again, don't you see, our work for God has great value. The whole idea of this spiritual life to come, it's not just so that we start thinking just about heaven, but it gives us a whole perspective on the work that we're doing in between. Remember I started off this sermon talking about how we have this, this, what comes after you believe. I've made this profession, but now if the goal is just heaven, then what am I going to do in this in in between time? Whatever time God gives me, what am I going to do with that? Do I just put the pause button and just kind of hope that I'm going to get to heaven by the skin of my teeth and hopefully maybe I find some kind of purpose? This text here is saying as a result of the resurrection of Jesus, your life has meaning, your life has purpose. That way, all of your work that is done for the Lord, it says, is not in vain. The resurrection not only provides meaning to life, but it offers purpose. If it weren't so, then it should have ended at verse 57. That just says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Jesus. Yay, we're going to heaven. But then he turns around and he says, but always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Paul directs his words to the present, to the tasks before us, to the challenges associated with life on this side of heaven. See, we are not called to huddle up and retreat from the darkness of this world. We are called to pierce the darkness with the light of Jesus. We are called to tear down strongholds, to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. In light of the victory assured us in the resurrection of Jesus, we engage the world in the power and in the name of Jesus. That's what he's asking us to do. 
That is part of the goal. The goal is this personal transformation that takes place inside of us. Why? Because you're going to live this life now as life is going to be in this kingdom to come. That's why when you read uh, the Lord's Prayer and he says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's because God's asking you to practice now what we will be enjoying forever. So what is the goal of all this? I can tell you one thing, that the resurrection of Jesus has placed us in a position now where it brings meaning and purpose. So let me, let me, let me, uh, let me conclude this way. Sometimes this is kind of difficult. You know why? Because people sometimes fall in two camps. In one camp, it's, it's comprised of these people who want to kind of, they want to hit the pause button on, on life in this world, and they want their minds to be so filled with the spiritual and heaven that very often people would criticize them and say that they're so what? Heavenly minded that they're no earthly good, right? Then you have people who fall in another camp and they're all about this sense of working in this world to make it better. The problem is that for some people in this camp, they give themselves so much to that that the input of the heavenly becomes less and less. So you become so earthly minded that you're of no heavenly good. And so on the one hand, it's like a seesaw, right? I, I, I get so engaged in the world itself that I lose my message. Or I become so entranced by this message that the next thing you know, I'm not talking to anybody because I've so detached myself from the world around me. We gotta be both. This text is saying that the power of the resurrection is realized in you living your life unshakable, immovable, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. There is purpose to my life in Jesus. Let me, let me illustrate this way. You have a family, they're gonna go on vacation. And um, like oftentimes, you're going to have different kinds of people that are on that vacation. What happens is you get those people that the minute you give them the destination, they're like this little mini GPS system. That address gets into their head, and the moment that address is locked in, the clock starts ticking, right? I mean, it's time to take off. The train leaves the station. Pedal to the metal, if they have only eyes for the road, clicking off the miles with little attention to the surroundings. And despite the cries of everybody in the car saying, I'm hungry, when are we going to stop? It's usually counted by, we're never going to get there if we stop every 500 miles. On the other side of that car are people who are a little bit more equipped with their Google searched map. They could tell you every piece, they could tell you where to stop for every little bit of history along the way. Where to find some local cuisine to stop off and eat at, or some must see photo op. They're not thinking about the time. They're not in any hurry to arrive at their final destination. They're thinking about the memories. It's all about the journey. Come on, let's take an adventure. And now you have all these people and they're all in the same car. And what happens? <laughs> Let the games begin. You know, the church can resemble that trip sometimes. People want to isolate from the world because there's a lot of pain in this world and I'd much rather just think about these godly things because when I think too much about this world, I find it depressing. There's sickness in this world, there's violence in this world, there's injustices in this world. And even though there are spattered rays of light and hope, the truth of the matter is our mortality screams 
And then I have this group over here, and it's, let's eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we're dead. Now, in the church, we need to have both and people with a mind for God and a love for the world, people who are engaged. And what I'm proposing to you this morning is simply this, that as Christians, people devoted to God and to his mission, we have to be as committed to this life as the afterlife, to this city as well as the heavenly city. And the resurrection of Jesus lays that out for us. Jesus' rising from the dead brings meaning and purpose to our lives. You want to know what comes after you believe? It's laying hold of this power and meaning and purpose and then to begin to dream God's dreams after him. Now, I know that's a challenge. Like, well, what is that goal? You need to have a goal, and you need to have some steps that are going to help you to achieve that goal, and you're going to have to make those steps habitual so that you're staying at it. We know this already. But are you really clear in your head what that goal is? Because if the goal is just getting to heaven, you're missing the boat big time. That's what this next series is about. This whole series is going to be about framing what is this goal that God has called us to from the point we we believe to the time that we come into this glorified city. And so I hope to take you on that little journey, and I'm praying that you guys are up for that. Because the death and resurrection of Jesus no doubt has brought meaning and purpose to us. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again for this hope that we have in you. I want to thank you for just the power that is promised and realized when we begin to frame our life and, and even all of the, the testings and trials, when we just frame them, Lord, in, the, in this overarching framework of what it means to be victorious in you. Lord, throughout the scriptures, we are confronted with a God who finds delight in bringing deliverance to his people. You have not left us here as orphans. We are not just walking around in the dark. You have sent the light. It has dispelled the darkness. I pray, Lord, that we would find ourselves clothed with the righteousness of Jesus and living in a way that influences those around us. Help us to run this race of faith with great endurance, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.